All right. So to kick things off, I feel like I got a couple ways I can ask this, but I'm going to go with the more fun one. Why archaeologists? We were talking about how much we love the archaeologist adventure genre. You're, you're Indiana's Jones, your national's treasure, um, et cetera, in the sort of, you know, cinemification of the old, you know, serialized uh, adventure stories, basically. Um, and then started laughing about how we were kind of fed this steady diet in our youth of archaeologists being sort of swashbuckling adventurers and how it would be so funny to see a world where that was actually the case. <laughs> yeah. That's opposed to just something you're told uh, once every few years when an Indiana Jones movie comes out, basically. So kind of going into that swashbuckling thing, I know this is not a show for kids, but <laughs> it does kind of have that Saturday morning cartoon vibe. So does that fit into the into the swashbuckle of it all? I think so. I mean, there's definitely a... a, a some nostalgia of it, you know, the, the Hamlin adventure eighties, uh, Saturday morning cartoons for sure is something that we love. Um, and we hoped to have some of that influence in it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just anything from like when we were kids, you know, yeah. Like Indiana Jones, uh, like Goonies. I mean, things beyond when we were kids too, but that sort of has that feel. I mean, like I've said this before, but like, Legend of Zelda is this way too, like where there's like a whole world out there to explore and it's full of mysteries and secrets and hidden temples and stuff like that. And, and, you know, you get older and you go like, oh no, it's not clear like that or whatever. But that <laughs> wonder that you have uh, when you play those things or when you watch those things as a kid is, is just a, a world we wanted to set it in where you're like, no, that is the case in this world. It's filled with like curses and enchanted objects and, hidden temples and secrets and mysteries and um you know that just felt like a world that felt like a lot of fun to explore and to put a bunch of like insane unhinged characters like rip into you know and you kind of mentioned before the national treasure of it all i definitely get a chaotic like i'm going to steal the declaration of independence vibe from rip <laughs> and so i guess i'm not way off but um i was wondering if you could speak a bit more about the character like the inspiration for that sort of energy yeah, yeah I, the Nick Cage baby. I mean, yeah, I don't think Rip would ever steal the Declaration of Independence, mostly for legal reasons. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, I mean, <clears throat> there's obviously influence uh, in where the voice started, uh, in from the Cage impression, um, and you know, he also happens to have started movies that were Indiana Jones adjacent, um, but. Um, that was the kind of speaking to the first thing we were talking about of the world being all about archaeologists and them being celebrities and, and then building out the character of Rip and deciding like, oh, we like this idea that he can't let go of things and he collects things and people and isms and old timey lingo and he's kind of stuck in the past and clinging to the past. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, there's still the, the, the hint of this voice there, but it's actually becoming its own thing, which was much more exciting to us. So speaking of some of the people he collects, um, Saltine is one of them, his sidekick, who I absolutely loved. Um, she's so lucky, she's so fun. I also found it was refreshing because this kind of show, I guess when we were all younger, the Robin to Rip's Batman would usually be like a young guy. And I was wondering if the intent to have her be a young woman was something that came about because of casting or was that something you were looking at from the outset? It was there from the outset because we wrote the script on spec uh, <laughs> before okay. we had pitched it and stuff and before anyone else was attached. Um, so it was there from the beginning, but I think we just, you know, we, we, we probably have a list like pages long of like potential characters that could have been in the show and just certain ones we kept gravitating toward especially as we started figuring out like well what would an episode of this be and i think just an important thing for us was like we just want to make sure everybody is funny on the show and we don't want a and and not to denigrate inspector gadget or something but you know they feel like there's certain shows from your childhood where you're like there's a really funny doofus at the center and then there's actually like the assistant, male or female, who kind of is the smart one who actually saves the day and is like the boring character in a way. And, and um, you know, no shade to Inspector Gadget. 
<laughs> <Right. laughs> Watch the title love. Um, you know, the, the cartoon or the live action movie. Or the live action, yes. Yeah. Very uh, true. Very true. But we were just like, okay, well, let's have, you know, we want Rip to have tr- literally an assistant. That's the, her position, but who is funny and stressed out and weird and eccentric in her own right and and cast it with someone who makes us laugh a ton. And, and you know, we were so fortunate that that became Mitra and, and she makes us laugh so much. And Andy and Mitra record together sometimes and, uh, you know, find new things that aren't in the script. And it's been really fun. There is a massive voice cast in this series, like some of the best comedic talent out there. But I'm like curious, did anybody in particular like really surprise you when they kind of stepped into record? That's a good question. I mean, in terms of our primary cast, I would probably say Dale, just because I was aware of her from Origins the New Black, but uh, not beyond that. And her voice, when you... Just when you hear her voice in a record, you're like, oh man, that is a perfect animation voice. Yeah. <laughs> like it's so resonant and it has such personality and she has great timing. Uh, so I wouldn't say like we were surprised she was good because we knew she was good and it was more we were just so happy that it came to us, that that, that idea came across our desk and we got to hear it and realize how cool it was. Yeah, it definitely helped the writing too. Like as because we were writing before we were recording but once we started recording and hearing dale's voice and hearing her bring the character to life it really affected the writing and we were able to kind of write more toward what makes her funny and makes agatha funny so is it different in developing like a script and animation where it's maybe not as easy to sort of riff off of each other because you are isolated in booths like i know mitra and andy record together sometimes yeah. but that's not the case obviously for the whole cast so i was wondering where the difference in creating comedy and animation comes in i mean there's a bit there was sometimes even if it wasn't like recording together like andy would be there like when we recorded daniel radcliffe and stuff so andy's not on a live mic at that time but he's riffing with daniel radcliffe a bit and so sometimes it was just like we still were able to capture the essence of feeling like we're doing it live um sometimes it's just me reading with the other person uh and and but trying to sort of you know, not just go like, let's just record this line seven times and then move on to the next, like trying to record a scene and get a little rhythm going and um, having fun with that. So part of it was, was we wanted it to feel like kind of alive and, and surprising in the way that we recorded it. Um, but then invariably you do, you know, record a bunch of different sessions and have to edit them together. And that's just where like animation and, and our great editors and, and, uh, the, the animation process, I mean, to say, like, really helps us kind of shape it together and pick in different takes and one seems good on its own. And then you hear what it's coming off of and you go, actually, maybe let me think the other one that does sounds like this. And, you know, it's just a, a lot of it's just the process. Uh, but it's been great that we have some pretty awesome people we're working with. Um, so the two of you have worked together before on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. But what has it been like to collaborate together or kind of build something from the ground up, like starting fresh, like that whole experience? I mean, it's been awesome. I've known Neil a, a while. I think he, we first met when I was hosting the MTV Movie Awards uh, and Ackerman brought him in because he also has uh, worked on Comedy Bang Bang Forever, which is one of my favorite things ever. Obviously, one of the silliest things ever created. Um, so we worked on that and then became friendly and I had been on Bang Bang a bunch of times and we worked together on that. And then... When I hosted the Emmys, he basically ran that with me and wrote incredible stuff. And then he worked on Brooklyn after that. So we, we've known each other a long time and collaborated a ton. And the, the reason we were so kind of hot to do something together is because we have such similar sensibility. Like we want to go for the dumbest joke possible. We don't want to shy away from that. We think it's to be celebrated and <clears throat> we make each other laugh. So, you know, when we were working together on Brooklyn, which was super fun unto itself, um, we kept talking about wanting to make something uh, new together. And we talked a lot about how much we love adult animation and all the shows that it had inspired us in that world. And we kept talking about how we wanted to make something where, you know, no matter what the joke was, if we were in charge, we wouldn't have to cut it. (laughs) (laughs) And that is Digman essentially so something that struck me about this show is 
the awareness of like archaeologists taking something from its home, displaying it somewhere else. And that is rightly a huge conversation right now. Um, So I'm guessing that was approached intentionally to just kind of pop up in the writing like, oh, right. That's what they do for a living. Like that was very intentional. When we wrote the pilot, the the sort of line that's in there, that we'll never have to think about the consequences. You know, that line was because we were one of our first conversations about doing a show like this was talking about like, hey, it's not so cool what Indiana Jones is doing. (laughs) That's not necessarily something you should be rooting for. Uh, And so having an awareness of that as we write it, you know, as as we came up with the character and as we wrote the pilot was, was part of it. And it kind of ebbs and flows in our narratives of like, some of the episodes have absolutely nothing to do with Rip and the and the crew being put on jobs that even raise that question. Like the ethics don't mm-hmm. become a part of it. Um, but obviously from the outset, we wanted to not act like we were oblivious to the fact that it's a complicated and... <laughs> yeah. I think it was in a really smart... Yeah, we have a really smart and funny writing staff. And priority number one was always being as funny as possible and filling something with jokes. But it doesn't mean we didn't also then sometimes have conversations. But like, oh, what are we saying here? Is this something we should be rooting for? Should we tweak this to, you know, change things? Like, how? what what are we saying here? So it was just part of the process was like, let's first of all, try to be funny. We're not trying to like write an essay. We're trying to be funny. And then, but then, you know, having to take responsibility for what you write and, and having those conversations. And sometimes things would change and sometimes, you know, be like, all right, I think we aren't betraying our values here. And so worked out. So speaking of the show generally, um, were there any like episodes, characters, concepts, like like non-spoilery that really took you by surprise as you were developing it and as you were writing it? I mean, once we hire, you know, when we were pitching the show, we kind of had a bunch of different ideas and one of them was like they break the ten commandments and then that the world is thrown into chaos because they think that means you don't need to follow them anymore and so that was like an idea andy and i'd had from the moment we were pitching the show and then there we hired a writing staff and they brought in a bunch of uh really funny ideas too and a lot of a bunch of it just sort of came out of the room and i couldn't even pinpoint a moment it would happen but like sort of all the twists with in in the third episode with the when they're seeking the commandments and and who they the backup set and all those right. twists and turns with with the with the creatures uh, <laughs> trying to be so vague and not spoil anything uh, <laughs> you know that wasn't something I don't think Annie and I would have thought of as we were pitching the show and just sort of came out of like following the story where it took us and felt like a fun surprise and the sixth episode has a big. Uh, as a big kind of object they're seeking that that was pitched in the room by one of our writers and just made us laugh a ton and yeah so are there any aspects oh this feels like an archaeology conversation i'm sorry are there any aspects of archaeology or exploration like not necessarily the technical but like the pulpy action adventure side of it that you maybe would want to explore that you didn't get a chance to this season i think uh not in any specific terms, but the reason we were excited to make the show is that it can feel like how these like, you know, global adventure movies feel now where we could be like, but they could go anywhere, you know, like, like, so we could just think of places on earth or like any place for mythology that has ever been alluded to on earth. And if we feel like that's something we want to do an episode about, we can we can go for it. So I don't think there's like one thing where like, oh man, we didn't get to do that. We have to do that. But it we already have a crazy long list that would last us many seasons of things that we think would be fun jumping off points. Yeah, just other worlds, you know, countries, terrain, cities, just like a lot of the fun a lot of times was like we come up with something and then our animators, once we see the designs, we're like, oh my God, they make Venice look so awesome or they make uh, you know, London looks so awesome or something like that. And it's just like, I'd love to see them do that with so many other places around the globe and, 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 and also fictional places as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a ton I'd be so excited to go explore and, and dig into the archeology span of other places. Unintended. Yes. <laughs> you don't care. Um, so Andy, I want to pivot for a second and ask, this is kind of a two-parter, but, um, 
I need to ask about the Lonely Island. So first, I want to know if you guys have anything coming up anytime soon. Uh, if you mean something where it's all three of us making something solely together with just the three of us, sadly, the answer is not right now yet. But we share our company, so kind of everything all of us are doing is sort of together. But I know that's not what the question actually is. Um, but I'm hoping soon. It's been really hard with kids living on different coasts, COVID shows, right. movies. Um, it's we're like turning into a trope of a comedy group that's like getting pushed apart in their old age. <laughs> oh, we we really want to make another album. We really want to make another movie together. We're constantly talking about how and when that could happen. Um, so I would say we 100% will. It just isn't in the immediate. And then I guess this ties back into Digman. And if this is a spoiler, that's fine. Um, I can take it out. But can we expect any musical moments from Rip Digman? Oh, He's still singing the pilot, so... He sings a little on the pilot. He's a little bit of a jazz man. He's a bit of a jazz man. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, we have Tim Robinson singing, so that's in the the beginning of the fourth episode. We... Fifth episode. Fifth episode. We invaded uh, the trailer we just put out with with the smash... The the slowed down smash mouth. We debated having Rip be doing the singing, but ultimately decided against it. So, not yet. It's a lot like the Lonely Island question. Seems inevitable <laughs> that it will happen, but it has, 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 it has not yet happened. And I will just leave that there for everybody to dig into. And that's my <laughs> terrible archaeology joke for the day. <laughs> okay, great. Love it. Um, last non-Digman question. Again, Andy, I want to ask about your upcoming movie, Lee, which is, okay. you know, it's a bit more maybe a serious thing than your fans are used to seeing from you. And I just wanted yeah. to know what that what that experience was like. Uh, it was really fascinating and I had a great time. Um, we shot in Budapest, um, and it's by far the most dramatic project I've ever been a part of. Was the bachelor Um, filming there when you were there? The bachelor? The bachelor went to Budapest this season. So I thought, God, I know I wasn't aware of that. All right. Just ask. Maybe they were, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I know they were shooting Dune too. So you're gonna pop up yeah. in back of Dune too and be like, "What's that?" Oh my god, I wish <laughs> fucking loved Dune so much. Um, it was it was a really amazing experience. You know, uh, the a big part of the draw for me, outside of the fact that I was really drawn to playing this real person, uh, David Sherman, and the script, was getting to work with Kate Winslet, who's uh, someone that I just really admire and I know has an incredible work ethic and. A consistent high quality of work so um when they asked if i'd be interested in that that was for me a, a big reason i was willing to give it a shot and sort of go out of my comfort zone um i haven't seen it yet so i don't know how much i am or am not even in it <laughs> could be a lot could be a little could be a medium amount uh, those options are all on the table <laughs> to that <laughs> Uh, but it was it was cool, man. I mean, it was really heavy and intense, and I feel like it's something I would not have been ready for even a few years ago in terms of my life experience to be able to let my guard down that much and be that uh, kind of grounded and real and and vulnerable to it because it really covers some heavy things. Um, but I'm glad I did it, and I, I can't wait to see it, and I hope it turns out great. All right, back to Digman, back to the archaeology. <laughs> what is something the two of you are really excited for fans to experience this season? Oh, man. I mean, the hope with this one truly, and it sounds kind of basic, but it's just our thing, is we just hope people really laugh. You know, we we went into it being like, let's let's go in with the intention of making something that people who genuinely love comedy can turn it on and just crack up and hopefully, like, quote it with their friends or something. You know, like, the sort of the back to the the reason we got into this and you know when we were first talking about doing it we were like so i've done this crazy sort of sketch format with snl and lonely island stuff neil has done it with bang bang and then we both got a ton of narrative episodic experience with brooklyn 99 and now we want to do something where we sort of marry the two uh the two skill sets basically yeah um so so we're hoping that that's how it lands 
Yeah. I mean, honestly, every episode feels different and special in its own way to me. And uh, there's not like, uh, um, I don't feel like it follows one strict formula and they, there's something in every single episode I'm excited for people to see. And, uh, yeah, there's little moments where I, you know, hope resonate with people the way they make me laugh. Just I could, something at the end of 104 or something at the cold open of the finale. It's like, there's just things here and there that really <laughs> make me tickle me or make me laugh. And, uh, I'm excited for people to see all of them. Yeah. All right. Couple of rapid fire things to end it out. So favorite pulpy, non-Indiana Jones, non-national treasure story. That's in, sort of in this genre. Yeah. Like sort of the archaeology pulpy adventure genre. And it can't be Dig Man either. No. <laughs> <laughs> we would never be so bold. <laughs> you know, I I don't know. I mean, I've, I said earlier, there's um, like... John Houston movie, the man who would be king us in to handy earlier. Like that's one that kind of inspired a little bit of like the pilot and stuff like that, that I think is really interesting. But in terms of like, uh, you know what I love is those South Park, like multi-part episodes where it's like a huge adventure, like the imagination land or the black Friday, like those, like that's what I love is like comedy. And they are just doing some huge genre adventure thing. And I think that really tickles me a lot. I mean, there's obviously also like the Mummy movies and I haven't seen them since I was a kid, but I really loved like Jewel of the Nile and Romancing the Stone. And those were kind of like romance action adventure. I feel like one of them was at least a professor or something, but I could be totally wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what their questions were. I mean, like Yo Jimbo or something is great to, you know, just like it's funny and crazy and stuff. Yeah. So bringing it back to everybody's favorite whip cracking archaeologist, second, of course, Drip Dickman, um, Indiana Jones. What is your favorite Indiana Jones moment? Do you have one? I mean, there's too many to choose from, but I will say one that really shaped my life was when the guy is doing all the crazy stuff with the knives and then he shoots him. Where you're like, and I, I know now from reading about it that that was like, they wanted to choreograph a huge fight scene. And I think it was Harrison Ford was like, why don't I just shoot him? Which is <laughs> fucking funny. Because then you watch it and you're just like, ah, oh, that's just the Indiana Jones franchise. And in one moment right there is like, you're get you're pulling something off that's both like super funny, but also fun. You feel like you're really on an adventure. But just the fact that they were able to get such a huge laugh in something that was so broad was really impressive, I thought. Um, when I was a kid, I saw Indiana Jones the Last Crusade in the movie theater. And, you know, the guy's face melts or kind of ages rapidly at the end. Um, and then that night I had a nightmare where uh, a skull said to me, How old are you? I'm 99. And then it bit my ear. And then I woke up and my ear hurt. So I'm out of <laughs> Uh, that was my moment. The uh, Last Crusade giving me a nightmare. Every, every, uh, the the face melting at the end of Raiders, it gave everyone nightmares. Yeah, like, I don't know anyone that didn't have nightmares for that. That and maybe large Marge and Pee Wee, uh, the like, claymation, which is so funny to think about now when you watch it. It's so goofy, <laughs> but like. I wonder if they feel like any responsibility for that. I feel like every kid in and the world had nightmares about that. I think they do because Crystal Skull did not have jump scares like that. So they're like, okay, we're not taking responsibility for this generation now. We traumatized yeah, yeah, the yeah. whole other one. Well, thank you both so much. Congratulations on the show. Um, all right. Well, thank you both. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Again.